Hello everyone. Today I'm going to teach about data, statistics and statistical thinking. In our world where data is important, understanding statistics is very important. We'll learn about different parts of statistics and how they help us understand things better. In this lecture, I'll talk about these topics. Descriptive and inferential statistics. I'll explain what descriptive and inferential statistics are and how they're different. Data and variables. First, we'll talk about data basics and then we'll cover different types of variables. Measurement scales. We'll learn about scales like nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio, which help us pick the right statistical methods. Data collection methods. We'll look at ways to collect data, like phone surveys, questionnaires sent by mail or email, and personal interviews. Sampling techniques. We'll learn common ways to pick a sample, like random sampling or stratified sampling. Types of statistical studies. We'll talk about two types of studies, observational and experimental. Misuses of statistics. I'll talk briefly about how statistics can be misused. Finally, I'll introduce the main statistical software tool we'll be using in this course. At its core, statistics is the science of conducting studies to collect, organize, summarize, analyze, and draw conclusions from data. In simple terms, statistics is about studying and understanding information. It involves gathering, organizing, looking closely at, and making sense of data. In our world today, where we have a lot of information, statistics help us make sense of it. It helps us find important information, see patterns, and make smart choices in different areas like science, business, and more. By carefully looking at data, statistics helps us find trends, check if our ideas are right, and understand how sure we can be about our conclusions. It gives us the tools we need to solve tricky problems, guess what might happen in the future, and come up with new ideas. Generally, there are two fundamental branches of statistics. Descriptive and inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics involve the collection, organization, summarization, and presentation of data. It provides us with a comprehensive understanding of the characteristics of a data set, including measures of central tendency, dispersion, and graphical representations. On the other hand, inferential statistics allows us to generalize from samples to populations. It encompasses tasks such as performing estimations and hypothesis tests, determining relationships among variables, and making predictions based on observed data. Now, let's think about an important question. Why should students study statistics? There are three good reasons. First, statistics help students understand and think critically about various types of statistical studies, like those where people watch or do things and those where people try something new. Second, by learning statistics, students learn important skills for designing and conducting experiments and working with data. These skills help them understand complicated information and make good guesses based on what they learn. Third, in today's world, sharing what we find out is important. Learning statistics helps students to communicate the results of their studies in a way that others can understand, which helps make a bigger impact. Let's start by clarifying some key terms. Data. It represents the values that variables can assume. These values can be numerical or categorical, forming the basis of our analysis. Variable. Variables are characteristics or attributes that can take on different values. They are the building blocks of data analysis, providing insights into various phenomena. Data value datum. Each value within a data set is referred to as a data value or datum. These values collectively form the basis of our analysis and interpretations. Dataset. A dataset is a collection of data values. It encapsulates the information gathered from observations, experiments, or surveys, enabling us to draw meaningful conclusions. Population. The population comprises all subjects or entities under study. It represents the entire group we seek to understand or analyze. Sample. A sample is a subset of subjects selected from the population. It serves as a representative subset, allowing us to make inferences about the population. Variables are crucial elements in data analysis, and understanding their types is essential for meaningful statistical interpretation. Let's look into the key distinctions. Qualitative variables. These variables are characterized by distinct categories based on certain characteristics or attributes. Examples include gender, race, academic qualification, and bachelor program. Qualitative variables are categorical and cannot be quantified numerically. Quantitative variables. Unlike qualitative variables, quantitative variables are countable and can be measured or assigned numerical values. 
These variables provide quantitative data that can be analyzed using statistical methods. For example, age, salary level, height, and weight. Discrete variables. Discrete variables are those that can only assume specific, separate values that can be counted. These values are typically integers and cannot be divided into smaller units. Examples include age and salary level. Continuous variables. In contrast to discrete variables, continuous variables can take on an infinite number of values within a given range. These values are obtained through measurement and can include fractions and decimals. Examples include height and weight. This figure shows a clear classification of variables with examples mentioned in the previous slide. Measurement scales play a crucial role in data analysis and interpretation. Let's begin by examining the four main types of measurement scales. Nominal. Nominal scales are characterized by qualitative variables with categories that have no natural order. These categories are mutually exclusive, meaning an observation can only belong to one category. For example, gender such as male, female, and race such as Malay, Chinese, Indian, Bumiputera, Sabah, Sarawak are nominal variables. Ordinal. Ordinal scales involve qualitative variables with categories that have a natural ordering. While the categories have an order, the differences between them may not be uniform or quantifiable. Examples include grades such as A, B, C, and rating scales such as poor, fair, good, very good, excellent. Interval. Interval scales pertain to quantitative variables where differences between values are meaningful, but ratios are not. In other words, Zero on an interval scale does not signify the absence of the quantity being measured. CGPA is an example of an interval scale, where zero does not mean the complete absence of academic performance. Ratio. Ratio scales involve quantitative variables where zero represents the absence of the quantity being measured, and ratios between values are meaningful. Common examples include height, weight, and income. For instance, a height of zero indicates no height and a ratio of 2 1 in weight means one object is twice as heavy as another. Now we'll be examining three common methods of data collection. Telephone surveys. This method involves conducting surveys over the phone, where trained interviewers ask respondents a series of questions. It's cost effective and allows for honest opinions due to anonymity. However, it may suffer from non response bias and limited reach. Also, the tone of voice of the interviewer may influence responses. Mailed emailed questionnaires. In this method, questionnaires are sent via mail or email to respondents who fill them out at their convenience and return them. It covers a wider geographic area and offers anonymity. However, it often yields low response rates and may face difficulties in understanding questions. Personal interviews. Personal interviews entail face to face interactions between interviewers and respondents, allowing for in depth responses and clarification of questions. However, it's costly due to the need for trained interviewers and may be subject to interviewer bias and limited reach. But now we delve into the crucial topic of sampling techniques, essential for accurate statistical analysis and interpretation. Let's explore four common techniques. 1. Random sampling. Subjects are selected using random numbers, ensuring every member of the population has an equal chance of being chosen. This minimizes bias and provides a representative sample. Two. Systematic sampling. Subjects are chosen systematically by selecting every K member after randomly selecting the first subject from 1 through K. This method is efficient and suitable for large populations. 3. Stratified sampling. Here the population is divided into subgroups or strata based on certain characteristics. Subjects are then randomly selected from each subgroup, ensuring representation across all segments of the population. 4. Cluster sampling. In this method, intact subgroups or clusters are randomly selected and all members within the chosen clusters are included in the sample. This is particularly useful when it's impractical to sample individuals directly. It's important to note that while sampling techniques are powerful tools, there's always the presence of sampling error. It is the difference between results obtained from a sample and those from the entire population. Understanding and minimizing this error is crucial for drawing accurate conclusions from data. Next, we will explore the types of statistical studies. There are two main categories, observational studies and experimental studies. In observational studies, the researcher passively observes phenomena without intervening or manipulating any variables. 
These studies focus on observing real-life situations or events as they naturally occur. Researchers draw conclusions based on these observations, but they cannot establish causal relationships as they can in experimental studies. Conversely, in experimental studies, the researcher actively manipulates one of the variables and examines how this manipulation affects other variables. By controlling the experimental conditions, researchers can establish cause and effect relationships between variables. Experimental studies are characterized by their ability to establish causal connections. Now, let's dip into the advantages and disadvantages of this observational study. Advantages 1. Observational studies often occur in natural settings, reflecting real-life scenarios. For instance, studying driving patterns on actual roads provides authentic insights into driver behavior. 2. In situations where conducting experiments would be unethical or downright dangerous, observational studies offer a practical alternative. For example, researching topics like suicide or murder necessitates observational methods due to ethical constraints. 3. Certain variables, for instance, drug usage, cannot be manipulated by researchers. Observational studies allow for the examination of these variables in their natural context without intervention. Disadvantages 1. Unlike experimental studies, observational studies cannot establish definitive cause and effect relationships. This is because other factors beyond the researcher's control may influence the results, leading to ambiguity in interpreting causality. 2. Conducting observational studies can be expensive and time-consuming. Gathering data from natural settings often requires extensive planning, coordination, and sometimes specialized equipment. 3. The accuracy and reliability of observational studies hinge on the competence of those collecting the data. Inaccuracies in data collection, such as human error or bias, can compromise the validity of the study's findings. Next, let's look into the advantages and disadvantages of this experimental study. Advantages 1. The researcher can decide how to select subjects and how to assign them to specific groups, allowing for precise control over variables. 2. Researchers can manipulate independent variables, facilitating the establishment of cause and effect relationships. Disadvantages 1. Experimental settings may not always reflect real-world conditions, potentially introducing bias into the study. 2. The Hawthorne effect may occur, where subjects change their behavior due to awareness of being studied, impacting the study's outcomes. 3. Confounding variables, which weren't separated from the independent variable, can influence the dependent variable, clouding the results. 4. Placebo effects might occur, where subjects exhibit favorable responses or improvements solely because they are part of the study. By understanding the advantages and disadvantages of both observational and experimental studies, researchers can choose the appropriate study, ensuring robust and reliable results. Now we're discussing the purpose and guidelines of a statistical study. The purpose of a statistical study is to gain and process information obtained from the study to answer specific questions about the subject being investigated. Here are the general guidelines we follow. 1. Define the purpose of the study. Clearly state what you want to achieve with the study. What questions are you trying to answer? 2. Define the variables. Identify the characteristics or factors you'll be studying. These are the variables that may change or influence the outcome. 3. Define the population. Determine the group or population from which you'll gather data. This is the larger group that your findings will apply to. 4. Describe the sampling method. Decide how you'll select individuals or items from the population to form your sample. This ensures your sample is representative of the population. 5. Organize, summarize, and analyze data. Collect the data according to your sampling method. Then, organize and summarize it using statistical analysis techniques. 6. Interpret results and discuss findings. Finally, interpret the data and discuss what the findings mean to your original questions. What conclusions can you draw from the analysis? Following these steps ensures that your statistical study is well-defined, accurately conducted, and provides meaningful insights into the subject under investigation. While statistics can provide valuable insights, they can also be misinterpreted or manipulated. Let's explore some common pitfalls. 1. Use very small samples to obtain information. 
small samples may not accurately represent the entire population, leading to skewed or unreliable results. 2. Use different value formats to represent the same data. Presenting data inconsistently can mislead the audience and distort perceptions of the information. 3. Make a claim in which no comparison is made. When claims are made without comparing them to relevant benchmarks or contexts, it's challenging to assess their validity or significance. 4. Imply connections between variables that may not exist. Correlation does not imply causation. Inferring connections between variables without sufficient evidence can lead to false conclusions. 5. Misleading graph or chart. Visual representations of data can be manipulated to exaggerate or downplay certain trends or comparisons, leading to misunderstandings or misinterpretations. By being aware of these misuses, we can approach statistical information critically and discerningly. I'm excited to introduce you to a powerful tool that will be our companion throughout this course, Microsoft Excel. Excel is a versatile software that allows us to organize, analyze, and visualize data in a user-friendly interface. With its familiar spreadsheet format, Excel simplifies complex tasks like calculations, data entry, and chart creation. Throughout this course, we'll harness the capabilities of Excel to explore statistical concepts, perform calculations, and visualize data. Whether you're a beginner or an experienced user, Excel will be an invaluable asset in your statistical journey. Finally, this is the main reference book that we will use throughout the course. I have provided the access link to this book on ITIL. Thank you and see you in the next video.